Good morning. Um, uh, announcement first. Uh, next Monday, we've got a, uh, a discussion about divestment, Princeton divesting from fossil fuels. Um, on the Canvas site, we've posted uh, a bunch of different documents. We'd like you to, to take a look at uh, uh, a few of them and to uh, look at the others if, you're, if you've got an interest in the issue. Um, there's the Princeton University official announcements, which are very short. They're like a page each explaining the rationale and how it fits with university divestment and dissociation um, procedures. And, and um, they're much longer documents, but they, to be honest, the, the, the dissociation criteria, if you look at the trustees' guidelines on that that they came up with over a period of about 20 years, I think most recently updated, around 2000 are pretty much just assertions of what the principles are rather than arguments for what they should be. There are a couple of practical arguments there, but nothing that has ethical underpinnings. And then um, we've also posted two short um, uh, documents from an ethical perspective, one arguing for and one arguing against divestment, all right? Then in addition to that, there is a much longer ethics piece by a guy named, a person named Moss that you can read if you're interested in that. And also the group Divest Princeton, who's going to be here in some strength, we're, we're not sure how many, but it'll be multiple people, um, that has argued strongly for divestment. Um, we've posted their proposal, which was not accepted certainly in full by the trustees. I can't remember if I posted their response. It's very short and it said, we welcome progress, but we won't give any money <laughs> until the university decides to divest. Because you know they decided that uh, there were very limited categories in which they would not only divest, but also disassociate. They use the word dissociate, which is a, an interesting word because it's from chemistry and and the mental health literature, disassociate is the, is the more common lingo English. Everyone else uses disassociate, but for some reason, Princeton's internal communications use dissociate, right? It's technically correct. I mean, maybe you just want to be different. I don't know. All right, well, anyway, have a look at that. And um, there won't be lecture. We'll give, um, I'll give a blurb, which is my view. Um, which to some significant extent the trustees took, but, um, but with caveats, right? They added some extra stuff. And um, DeVest Princeton will give their view, and uh, Professor Cups, um, uh, 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 Simona, <laughs> I can't remember, is it Capisani or Capisani? <laughs> it, it will give uh, um, an ethical perspective. So, so that's the, um, that's the order. Um, I want to finish uh, last time's lecture. I'm not going to dwell on it, but there are a couple of things. I was talking about the Net Zero America project, which was done here, and is used all over the place um, in the um, Biden administration and Congress. And the reason is that it is granular. So that's the 2030 picture of wind and solar. That's 2050. Uh, zooming in, that's what the city of St. Louis looks like, according to this study, in one of the scenarios in 2050, okay? And so those, there are wind and solar uh, facilities distributed around St. Louis in the best locations for wind and solar and in land that is zoned to allow wind and solar. So the study is granular, as I said, at the six kilometer level, and that's, it turns out, what makes it um, uh, influential, and that's by design. Politics, not at the national level, but at the congressional level, is local in that your representative wants to provide services, not just to the nation, but to her or his constituents, right? And so if you don't have a local analysis, you can't answer the question, what's in it for my people? Okay, and so that's what turns out to be influential in the long run. What's in it for my people? 
And at the national level, you also have to have something like this built up. So you can, you know, it, the executive branch will say, this is what it does for American jobs, and a representative from the Gulf Coast in Texas say, yeah, but what about for my people, where the jobs are going to be lost? Um, this just shows a CO2 pipeline network. And this is the sort of thing that um, leaves, um, uh, normally leaves greens uh, really upset because they don't want any fossil fuel and they don't want any carbon capture and storage. But um, it turns out this thing stores 930 million tons of CO2 annually. And in the feasible and least expensive 100% renewable case we could come up with, the pipeline network needs to move 780 million tons per annum instead of 930. So it's essentially the same network. It's a little bit thinner. Some of those lines aren't quite as fat. But our society moves CO2 around. It's going to need to move CO2 around anyway, right? And so that is um, uh, interesting. Now, you, could, you can increase the cost of the renewable system a whole bunch more and, and eliminate this sort of thing, all right? But it, it becomes really, uh, you know, 4x more expensive. I mean, it becomes a lot more expensive. So this is you know, decarbonizing cement and other industrialized processes, and also decarbonizing biomass so as to create a sink and that sort of thing. Um, uh, so in general, uh, for all the different kinds of, of uh, net zero systems that we looked at, the 2020s were the time to clean up electricity and to um, uh, really start the decarbonization of transport. The 2030s were the time to finish up transport. And the 2040s were the time to do everything else. And so the 2020s and 2030s, you want to put the infrastructure in place, like CO2 pipelines and other things, to make sure you can finish in the 2040s. And in the 2020s, you want to build recharging stations and start to get car fleets, you know, start to increase the, the offerings and to decrease the charge times for electric vehicles. But you really don't bring it in until the 2030s. And so this is largely what the Biden plan has. It's accelerated a little bit, um, but it's mostly done by the 2020s. Um, so how much does all this cost? The answer is, is um, surprisingly little. So, so this is the trajectory of the fraction of GDP we've spent on energy in the United States um, from, well, when we stopped collecting this data uh, 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 until, um, uh, until we did the study, which started in 2019, going backward. And these are the forecasts for different kinds of energy systems going forward, from fossil to 100% renewable, OK? So this encompasses the full range of feasible energy systems. And the, the, um, the range from the Net Zero America project is the purple. And in there is the cheapest net zero system, roughly. This document is actually from the National Academy report that provided the policy manual for Congress um, that has been used in the, the infrastructure bill and in the and the reconciliation bill that is, is still pending. Um, but it's drawn from, the figure comes from the Net Zero America Project, and, and all the National Academies did was to um, add in other, other authors, all of whom uh, agree approximately. And, and the take home message here is that we can transition to net zero at the same or less cost than we're used to paying for energy. All right, so that's the big deal, right? It's all of a sudden not any more expensive. And if you look, at paired scenarios, with, with um, one being business as usual and the other being, um, uh, a net, let's say, the cheapest net zero system, what you find out is that it costs, in the 2020s, around $200 billion to our economy to do this. And now $200 billion in an economy of our size is round off error. Right, it's a fraction, it's just, it's a tiny little number that you can't, it's not different from zero. That's the important point. But one thing you can um, calculate really quite effectively 
is what this would do to healthcare costs in the United States, because we know what fine particulate matter from fossil combustion does to healthcare. And the answer is you save a trillion dollars, okay? So there's no question about it, even without considering the climate benefit at all, even without considering macroeconomic uh, uh, interactions like a decrease in the cost of fossil fuels that you're still using because the demand falls, even without any of that, just considering the healthcare impact, this is net negative cost now, all right? And so, and the federal government has to spend less on health care. Now, exactly how this is financed depends on the final mix that comes out of the reconciliation bill. The cheapest way to finance it from the sort of um, optical perspective, what, what it seems like to the public, is to simply have standards and say, okay, we're going to have a clean electricity standard. We're going to reach 80% in 2030 and 100% by 2050, and that's the standard. You have to meet that if you're a power company. Same thing for electric cars. That then passes the cost on the, to the consumer, and then most sort of environmental justice impulses would then provide rebates of some kind to low-income people to, to compensate them, right? So that's the sort of, that was what the Biden administration came in with. But with a 50-50 Senate, the reconciliation process has to be about budget. If you want to avoid the filibuster, it has to be about the budget and expenditure. And so a standard doesn't cut it. So instead, it was going to be done with subsidies and penalties. So you're going to subsidize the company transitions to, say, renewable power. You're going to subsidize electrical vehicles. And you're going to penalize those companies that lag behind. With um, Senator Manchin and Cinema's objections, the penalties have been pulled away. So now only the subsidies remain. They're probably still enough because it's a gigantic subsidy. It's $300 billion in the current bill, all right, for an expenditure. And that's only a fraction of the 2020s, and the whole cost of this thing is low for the so. So the point is that we're not going to do this in a way. And so that's why it sounds like a big number. It's going to be like a trillion dollars for the bill or something because because you're not the government is actually spending the money in some sense. And so um, from an economic perspective, that's not a cost. The money comes from people's paychecks, goes into taxes, goes into the economy and provides some services, all of which would have happened almost anyway. And so it's not really a cost from an economist perspective, but it is possible to produce big sounding numbers out of it. But that's the this is the primary take home message about the feasibility of technology now. We can transition to net zero, basically at scratch cost. And that wasn't possible three years ago. It was twice as expensive three years ago, almost. This just is a showing how fast the air quality improves as you decarbonize versus business as usual. And it's because, of course, you close the coal plants first. First, you kill the coal plants. That's what happens. And the coal plants are what's killing almost everybody <laughs> that air pollution kills. So, so that's why it's such a big deal. Also, you know, there's all this talk about jobs, 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 and blah, 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 right? And how many jobs we're going to create. And then the, the, the Republicans say how many jobs it's going to cost. And the Dems say how many it's going to create. And, and there isn't really a granular analysis. And, and this is a, a granular analysis. This goes much finer than this. It goes down to the county level. But this just shows a graph of energy law, uh, jobs through time from NZAP uh, in these categories. So wind and solar are the, the blue and the, and the gold. And the fossils are the other colors. And what you see from this graph is in state after state after state, employment increasing. This shouldn't be too surprising because employment is concentrated in a few places that produce fossil energy right now and in the few places that produce lots of electric power. And almost every place produces wind and solar later on, and there are jobs then every place. So in place after place after place, the solar jobs in particular, but also the wind jobs, just dominate up and up and up and up, okay? Now, there are a few places in which the decreases in the fossil jobs and there are decreases in fossil jobs just about everywhere, too, right? So they're losers here. 
But the decreases in fossil jobs are, are concentrated so that in a few places there is at least a transitory net decrease in jobs. One is in Senator Manchin's home state of West Virginia, where the decline in coal jobs causes this transitory decrease, followed by a rapid increase, primarily from wind and solar. Turns out, per capita, West Virginia has higher revenues from wind than just about any state in the union. All right, it's because there's not very many people, and there are all those mountains they've blown the top off of that are flat with an excess road running up them. It's like perfect for a wind tower, okay? A little bit in Kentucky with Mitch McConnell, but this is where Senator Manchin's um, uh, issue comes from. And the fact that his, you know, he's personally, his family, he personally is invested in the coal, in the coal industry. And secondarily, Louisiana here, just sort of get a little boost and then they just take it in the shorts. Same with Oklahoma. Texas is a little more complicated because Texas is such a great state for renewables as well. But the Gulf Coast here, you really have trouble. New Mexico, it's okay for a while and then you get a little bit of a decline in, in New Mexico. Arizona has a transitory decline as well. The Intermountain West, Wyoming, all right? Don't expect support from Wyoming, all right? Wyoming has already built out a lot of its uh, wind, and it's uh, 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 poised to lose fossils. So this is where the story comes from, you see. And, and, and the point is that the, the analysis that says there will be job increases in most communities is extremely robust, simply because photons and wind is available almost everywhere, whereas fossil is produced in only a few places. And it's as simple as that. And so a lot of the work in the Biden administration has been focused on, for instance, how do you build hubs of net zero manufacturing that don't need to be tied to any particular geographic location? How do you build them first in these regions that are gonna lose uh, uh, jobs as a way to compensate proactively with creating jobs? All right, so that's been the game here, politically, to try to get support. With that said, they're not gonna get any, they got a few people to cross the aisle. Uh, there's a little bit of bipartisanship for the, for the so-called infrastructure bill, but for the reconciliation bill, if it passes, it'll be 51 votes, including uh, Vice President Harris, and 100% opposition against, even though it's easy to show that from a healthcare standpoint, from a health of the environment standpoint, and from a, from a job standpoint, in almost every one of these red state locations, it is advantageous to their constituents to shift. And this is particularly so because the wind and solar alternatives, like biomass, are land hungry. And the revenues go disproportionately to rural states, which are disproportionately Republican. So, so when people say the climate wars are over, ask yourself, how can this be, right? The answer is they aren't. We've got enshrined in, political, um, in the political parties um, opposition or support for a proposition that is untethered to the remaining propositions, and thus so far immune to technological revolution, which I think is really interesting, all right? It's become that tribal. I also don't think it's sustainable over the long term, all right? They can't keep asking to spend more. <laughs> and also the economy will find some sneaky way to, to supply the low power, just not as fast as um, the Dems and some others want to do it, all right? I'm not gonna do China. Um, there's a bunch of stuff on China here. And um, I don't want to um, belabor it because China's going to do what China's going to do. China has the same kinds of assets that we do in the U.S. The, the big exceptions are that China doesn't have very much natural gas at its disposal. China has a um, few geologic reservoirs that have been mapped to put CO2 that's captured in. Um, uh, it does have reservoir capacity, but and, and the engineers can probably figure it out, but it's still not certain 
And so they're going to be more reliant on firm sources of electricity other than um, gas with CCS, the way the U.S. seems to be banking on, because there isn't this big push for nuclear, and what else is there? You're going to have to have something, right? And we have superabundant gas, and we have the reservoir. So I think that, that that's currently the, the, unless something is invented, that's the default U.S. position. China is betting on nukes, as they announced two weeks ago you know, at the beginning of the COP, they're betting on nukes, and they're going to be installing nukes big time, and they won't be 1950s reactor designs. Um, if some of them work and are as safe and inexpensive as the designers hope, then I think you could look for nukes to come back in on the second wave in the United States, 2060, 2070, when you start replacing the gas plants, right? All right, so I'd like you to do just a real quick clicker question to see whether or not any of this has changed anybody's opinions, okay? Um, and and, and um, I'm going to give it 10 more seconds, so push some buttons. <laughs> I may do another one, depending on how this comes out for the U.S. alone, all right? Because this says right now humanity. <laughs> that's a big number. All right, that's, that's it for now. Let's take a look. Uh, it's pretty much the same as what it was before, right? I think it's a little bit more weighted to um, the bees than it was before. Um, let me see about the next one. Um, that any of the top 20 emitters, can, oh, here, is, I, think I've got an, I think I've got this right. Is this good now? Am I doing, yeah, I'm doing another one here. Yeah, so it's growing with very optimistic, and that's what usually happens, right? Um, the, the point is that um, getting the whole earth to do it is hard because nations are struggling to get out of poverty, and a lot of them just limit, have limited capacity. Right? It's just really hard to do this kind of planning and do it fast. You have to have all kinds of administrative resources that you can mobilize. Um, and, and this is very difficult for a lot of developing, a lot of developing countries because they've got other problems. You know? But I think most people, when they look at the technical situation, say, yeah, there may be political setbacks in this country or that country, but right now the economic path is kind of downhill. Right, and so, so this thing ought to ought to roll through in some of them. All right, so that's that's that. I now want to. Oops, did I screw up? Yeah, the other one. Yeah. Is this? Uh, do I need to? Okay, you can just click out of that. All right, so I want to talk now a little bit, and I'm gonna I'm gonna run on a little, uh, run over a little bit. There's there's time, <laughs> there's padding in the in the sequence for me to finish to finish this up. I want to talk about um, what I'm calling a backstop for current um, emissions, and the idea is that. Um, Humanity already has the capacity to pull CO2 out. Of, so, so emissions that we're worried about, we're taking CO2 from a geologic reservoir if it's fossil, or from a terrestrial ecosystem if it's a forest that's being deforested, and we're transferring that carbon in hydrocarbons, um, or oxidizing it, and putting it in the atmosphere as CO2. That's the problem, the first approximation. So it's possible to reverse that, to take CO2 out of the atmosphere, put it into hydrocarbons, and put those hydrocarbons below ground in geologic reservoirs or on the land surface, 
And so if it's possible to do that, it's actually possible industrially to do a complete reversal of the set of practices, industrial practices, that got us to where we are today with climate change. Um, and, but the question is, what's the state of the technology? And what will the place for this technology be in the transition? It's certainly a really active area for people who are interested in startups, all right? Because if you can figure out a cost-effective way to do this, it's kind of cool, right? You can, you can undo any emission, right? It can be used to offset the emissions of any sector that lags behind in an attempted transition to net zero. And those that lag the behind, people get more and more desperate. They'll pay more and more to do it, right? So it's potentially very lucrative. All right, so this is what I just said. Negative emissions technologies remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it on or under the, the Earth's surface. And from an atmospheric perspective, removing it and storing it is exactly the same as not emitting it. And in some cases, deploying NETs may be cheaper and less disruptive than emissions reductions. And from the perspective of the atmosphere, it's the same thing, right? And so most observers, just if everyone, thinks that negative emissions technologies are going to coexist with mitigation technologies for centuries, all right? And that we're gonna do a fair amount of this, particularly because some kinds of emissions are really hard to mitigate. Uh, a minority, though, small minority. So the, the, so, so NETs, if we view them as the component of the mitigation portfolio, how much do we need and do we have enough? I've just gone through. Now, this is, this is at the 10% level that we need to do this sort of thing, perhaps. And so I haven't focused on it in the previous you know, uh, slides that I've been talking about the transition to net zero because, because I was worried about the 90%. But let's now talk about this 10%, because this also would be a way to keep removing CO2 from the atmosphere over the long term, and to, to, to over the long period of time, in a process very similar to what we would have to do if we terraformed a planet with a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, we should be able to draw it back down again. A global engineering sort of program lasting a couple of centuries. So, you know, I think I've shown this before. This is um, a, a Paris decarbonization diagram that, that shows the prevailing view even three years ago that we're gonna have to have a lot of negative emissions to offset the remaining positive emissions late in the century, and that these might grow to something like five gigatons by 2050 and 10 by 2060. Quite a bit, 10 gigatons of CO2, right? So that's on the order of, you know, 15% of global emissions. And of course, you can make this as big as you want. You can say, well, I'd like to just keep emitting fossil. So why don't we just offset all the fossil with negative emissions technologies? And if we could figure out a way to do that, that would be a perfectly viable way to combat the global warming problem, perhaps not other um, uh, environmental and other problems that come from fossil fuel. Uh, uh, but you know, fossil fuels provide some benefits too, right? So, so, um, so the question is, how much do we have? We could use it all if it was, you know, we could use an arbitrary amount up to the total energy demand if it was cheap enough. And as I think I've shown you before, this is the IPCC 1.5 degree report. There are ways to reach one and a half degrees by getting to net zero by mid-century that have almost no carbon sinks, no negative emissions, and there are ways to get there with huge negative emissions. And if you get there with huge negative emissions, this gray area of fossil emissions is much larger later than it is if you don't have the negative emissions on hand. See that? So this is a crash global decrease in the next decade this is not quite Extinction Rebellion, but it's getting there, right? Whereas this is a long, slow, steady, the globe doesn't really start reducing until 2030 or so, right? And so it makes a difference about what we're gonna do next. The gold here is a thing called BEX, right? And the, that's where you, again, take 
biomass from a crop, like a big C4 grass, if that means anything to you, grasses that are as taller than I am, um, that you can grow where you grow corn. You harvest the grass and you stuff it in the maw of a gasifier and out pops hydrogen and CO2. And you burn the hydrogen or you turn the hydrogen into a sin fuel. You do something to use the hydrogen for the economy, burn it in a jet engine, make electricity or something. And you take the CO2 and you put it back in a geologic reservoir and you get a negative emission and you get a, you get a fuel for heat. So that's what this process is. The downside again is that it takes cropland to do that or biodiversity land. Um, if we look at net zero emissions budgets, um, these are non-additive after the last line. So uh, this last line, ignore it for a second. All right, so globally in 2020, we may have 55 gigatons CO2 equivalent emissions. 37 are fossil um, and cement and negative emissions from BEX and direct air capture, which are zero. So 37 from positive emissions from fossil fuel and cement. Um, methane emissions, CO2 equivalent, about eight, and f eight globally, and 203. Fluorinated gases, like some refrigerants and stuff, one. Natural climate solutions, which are carbon sinks that are occurring now, like the big 700 megaton sink in the regrowing eastern deciduous forest, or the CO2 fertilization sink in the Amazon, contribute about six giving you a total of 55. And of that 55, the total number of sources from agriculture, forestry, um, uh, land, uh, uh, agriculture, forestry, I don't know what else stands for, and other land use, <laughs> okay. Afalu, it's, there's not supposed to be an L there, okay. Um, is the three quarters of the methane, almost all the N2O, um, and, um, uh, 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 natural deforestation, all right? And um, those, are the, those are the sources. And then in a global 2050 scenario, this has got to be zero. There's still some residual methane. There's still some residual um, uh, uh, N2O, almost all of it from agriculture, forestry, and other land use. No fluorinated gases. And you're gonna create carbon sinks, what are called natural climate solutions, that roughly balance the agricultural and forestry and land use sources. And that turns out to be robust given the technological mix we have. We know how to store carbon on the land by regrowing trees and fiddling with agricultural sources. We don't really know or have a cheap way of doing anything else right now to create negative emissions. And that means that in all of these budgets, if you look at them, in 2050, when you reach net zero, the land will be approximately zero emitting because ongoing emissions, primarily of methane and N2O, are balanced by sinks created by forestry and agriculture. All right, so zero's out the land. And the rest of it, all the industrial stuff, also has to be net zero which it is here, see, there's a zero there. And so it, it's kind of neat that, you know, instead of thinking about these negative emissions technologies as taking the heat off of the industrial system, given current technology where the negative emissions technologies aren't even really technologies, they're land use practices, all they allow you to do is zero out the land and the industrial stuff has to be itself zeroed out independently. So it's like it makes the problem separable, all right? So the agriculture and the natural climate solutions don't save us from needing to decarbonize the, the fossil and industrial system. That's the take home here. And this is the same story in the United States, all right, where you're zeroing out this and the ongoing agriculture, forestry, and other land use sources balance within 100 megatons the natural climate solutions. Biden is counting on 850 megatons of sink in the reconciliation bill, up 150 megatons from the current 700. 
it's going to require a little bit more work than it sounds because the eastern deciduous forest is starting to become mature. And so we would expect its sink to decline by maybe 300 megatons through, through, through 2050. So he's actually planning on something like 400 to 500 megatons worth of carbon sinks. Okay? So these are our negative emissions technologies. One you hear a lot about are coast, is coastal blue carbon, restoring wetlands along the coast. This is a great idea ecologically because if you restore coastal wetlands like in Louisiana, you help protect the land from storm surges and other things that are coming from climate change. So there's a huge benefit in coastal protection. Turns out to produce something close to bupkis for carbon. And the reason is not that is, is, is not that it doesn't work per hectare, right? So per unit land area of restored, car, uh, of restored coastal wetland, you get a lot of carbon stored. The problem is, is that the coast is linear. And the center of the land is, is an area. And so there just isn't enough land to add up to much to be material. So this is talked about a lot. It has to be coastal wetlands because um, if the water is fresh water, then the, in the summertime, the marsh gets stinky. And when it gets stinky, it means that it's gone anoxic. And when it's anoxic fresh water, it emits methane. And that's bad, right? That undoes the benefit. If it's the salt water, for some reason, methanogens haven't gotten good at salt water. Something really fundamental there but just a bit of salt water. And the wetland, if it's salt water inundated, doesn't emit methane, but does store carbon, all right? But of course, from the perspectives of this course, we don't need to know any of that because this is small, all right? It's just a, you know, you might use it to buy somebody's vote in Congress, right? Support it to buy somebody's vote. On the margin per hectare, it might be a good thing to do. It's a great idea to do if you want to protect the coastline. But there's not much of a carbon story here. The terrestrial piece is big. Bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration, we sort of knew how to do, but it's hungry for land and there's no large scale implementation of it. Um, direct air capture, these are industrial machines that suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. The capacity could be infinite, we don't know. And carbon mineralization. Uh, getting rocks to take CO2 up by crushing them up for special kind of rocks. So let's look at each of these. So this is the terrestrial carbon removal and sequestration. You can afforest, which means that you can plant trees in places where they've never been. You can reforest, which means that you plant trees in places where they used to be and were cleared for agriculture. You can change forest management. The simplest way to do that is let's suppose a forest is producing two tons of carbon in wood per hectare per year. You could wait 50 years to harvest 100, or you could wait 20 years, harvest 20, and then do that five times. You still end up approximately with the same amount of wood harvested, but the average carbon stored in the landscape in an age-structured mosaic of patches stored at different times is equal to the average age carbon storage, which for a 100-year rotation of cutting is going to be 50 years. So the landscape is going to consist of places that are just been cut, places that are 100 years from being cut, with the average at 50. And that 50-year average, because it's approximately linear, the carbon storage is going to be that of a 50-year-old forest, right, for the whole landscape as a whole. And that's pretty big. Whereas if you do 520s, you only get the carbon storage of a 10-year-old forest on average on the landscape, which is not very much. So by simply lengthening the rotation period, which is not the most economical thing to do if you're worried about the time value of money, so you need to subsidize it a little bit, you can actually get carbon stored by changing forest management. And finally, you can change the way you manage agricultural soils. The simplest way to do that, the way that ubiquitously works the most, is to stop plowing, 
which brings organic matter up to the atmosphere where it oxidizes, gets in contact with oxygen, and instead drill seeds into the soil with a drill, okay, a soil drill. And then during the fallow period to plant a cover crop, something that is like a rosette that germinates really early in the springtime and covers all the land up so that it's storing carbon even when it's not producing a crop. And then you plow that under when you plant, right? Or, 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 or ideally, you use a plant that has a phenology that ends in the spring, a life, a life cycle that ends in the spring so that they all convert to seed anyway. So those are the fact, those are the things. The, the limiting factors are available land. Um, there are some practical barriers like demand for the for, for wood, if you're going to lengthen the rotation during the interval in which you're going to the longer rotation, you have less wood available. But, but, but the biggest limitation um, is just the limited per hectare rates of carbon uptake in the existing forests and, and agricultural lands. So reforestation is in principle very attractive if you had the land, like if meat substitutes work and you can have a billion hectares of of rain-fed pasture. Then you go from cropland, which looks like stuff on the right, two tons of carbon in the vegetation and 50 tons of carbon in the soil, back to 200 tons of carbon in the trees and 100 tons of uh, carbon below ground after 100 years or so, all right? And so that's 900 tons of CO2 per hectare taken up in the transition. That's a lot, 900 tons is a lot. Per acre, that means about 400, which means on a you know, quarter acre US lot, it's 100 tons, all right? And you know, 100 tons is a big number, all right? If, you know, it's it's, a, it's um, a 200,000 pounds. It's like burying three loaded cement trucks in your, your yard or something like that. It's a lot of stuff. Okay, there are concerns about permanence um, so what happens if somebody goes and cuts the forest down later? It's got to be a permanent transition for this to work, all right? Because the carbon comes out of the atmosphere, but if you cut the trees down, it goes back, right? So you've got to have it go to forest forever so that the forest, which is growing and giving birth and dying all the time, stays at 200 tons of carbon per hectare. But if you clear cut it again and convert it back to agriculture, all reverses. Now. This sounds terrible, but the same is true of fossil resources we leave in the ground. They also, too, represent an economic um, uh, lure for any future uh, uh, owner of the land to exploit, right? And so, and so it's also true that, that not exploiting fossil, not burning fossil, isn't permanent necessarily either. It all depends on what people in the future do. People can undo what we try to, what your generation tries to achieve if they decide to. So this permanence issue is made a big deal out of, but seems to me to be kind of strained, right? There are a couple other things to worry about. One is shown on this slide. Turns out that boreal forest, forests in the far north, if you plant trees, you warm the planet, you don't cool it. And that's because the forest is dark in color relative to snow. And the forest trees, if you, if you were to remove them, expose the snowpack to the sky and increase the albedo of the planet, which reflects sunlight back into space, all right? Especially during the spring. So this turns out to be a giant effect. And all of the CO2 and other benefits of the forest from the climate perspective are are eliminated and reversed by this giant albedo effect. So reforestation only works sufficiently far south. Temperate forest is on the is on the on the on on, on the side where the CO2 storage is bigger than the um, than the albedo effect, um, and the further south the better. And then in the tropics, there's no question about it. The CO2 impact plus the increased evapotranspiration to some extent, which gives you evaporative cooling, cools the planet. So, so the whole forestry thing is kind of limited away from the far north, and that's too bad because the boreal forest is gigantic, right? 
It goes all the way around the circumpolar, Canada, Alaska, and Russia. Second thing is, is that if you forest in places that haven't been forested historically, which aren't these mesic, these wet pastures we're talking about with meat substitutes, why well, I don't talk about dry pastures, semi-dry pastures, places like the land in Kansas, right? Western Kansas in particular, but also, also central Kansas um, or central Nebraska, um, where you've got maybe a meter or 800 millimeters of rain or something per annum. The problem is that the, the land, um, the streams that run, currently run because uh, water falls on them and it doesn't evaporate and some of it goes into the streams and runs down the stream. If you plant trees there, you increase the evaporative surface and what this graph shows is that you lose the streams, all right? And that pisses people off. So if you, if you grow trees in places where they haven't been historically, and those places are primarily where they were limited by too little water, right? Or the fire that comes with limited water, what happens is you dry up all the rivers. And in those places, people, because they're a little bit on this arid side, are really depending on the rivers. The place this sort of played out the earliest was in South Africa, where um, people were reforesting the headwaters of streams up in the coastal mountains above Cape Town, for instance. And all the farmers depended on irrigation at the bottoms of those streams, lost the stream altogether, and it created this, this you know, internal conflict where, where the foresters, the forestry companies, were stealing from the agriculturalists, all right? And they've had to, had to deal with it. But this is, this is another caveat. Um, also, our knowledge of how to manage the agricultural soils, so that the agricultural soils, because of plowing following, um, um, you know, the Neolithic Revolution and the increase in agricultural technology, have lost about half the carbon that used to be in them. And the carbon was really good for the soils. It increased their productivity, it increased their water holding capacity, it increased their ability to store nitrogen. And so it's bad that they've lost um, all the carbon. One of the reasons that it takes so much fertilizer to grow, do modern agriculture is that, um, is that the soils themselves are degraded, right? And more so in some places than others, to be sure. But still, it's a global phenomenon. And so we know that if we implement some practices like drilling seeds in the soil and planting a cover crop, you can reverse that and rebuild that carbon backbone, and the soils become more healthy. Great co-benefits. But as this graph shows, this is the... Um, amount of carbon in the soil with the sequestration rate. And it shows the trend, which if you know math means that it comes to equilibrium out here with about 100 tons, which is what it should do. But the thing I'd like you to focus on is just how big the variability is. So you can implement exactly the same thing in a plot that looks the same to you. And for decades, this place will store carbon like gangbusters. And my poor field might lose carbon, OK? And so if you're getting paid per project, this is terrible. You, you take on all the expense to buy the seed drill and stuff like that, and your land might lose carbon. Plus, you've got to, you know, you've got to monitor everybody's place, right? But if, on the other hand, it's a society that's implementing this, and they're paying you for the practice, not for the outcome, then what you're going to do is you're going to get the mean. You're going to get the red line, OK? And that's, good. that's OK, right? Because that means you're storing carbon on average across the landscape, even though some places you're losing it. The point is that the high variability in this figure, then, doesn't invalidate the practice. But it does mean that there's a lot of work to be done to figure out why some places are losing and some places are gaining. Because if you knew that, you could do a much more effective job of using this as a technology. So even this agricultural stuff, still needs work, OK? That's, that's my point. We still have a lot of work to be done. And I'll finish this next time, all right?